I guess I, I guess we'll just get started. Uh, hi, I'm Caroline Sinders. I'm um, I'm the moderator for this panel, Information. Uh, I work with chat robots at IBM Watson. Please don't tweet that. Um, and we're just going to go, I guess, right down the panel in order of, of speakers, or presenters, rather. Um, Ava, do you want to introduce yourself? Eve, sorry. <laughs> Eve. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Eve. Um, I am I'm a project manager at a data company called Enigma, and I'm going to be talking about the intersection between government open data and privacy. Hi, I'm Maria Schreiber from the University of Vienna. I'm a PhD candidate in media and communications, and I'm going to be talking about photo sharing practice. Hello, my name is Jack Webster from the University of Southampton and the Web Science Institute. I'm going to be talking about a theoretical approach for analyzing music recommender systems as cultural intermediaries. Hi, I'm Nick Siever. I'm an anthropologist and a professor at Tufts University just outside of Boston. Great. So um, every each presenter has around 12 minutes to present, and then afterwards we'll do Q&A. Be mindful, uh, your questions should follow code of conduct and be respectful of any of our participants up here. But we're looking forward to having a really engaging discussion post the presentations. And I guess without further ado, we'll start with Eve. Okay, so I already said my name is Eve. I'm a project manager at this public data company called Enigma, but I'm here to talk about a recent research project that I did while I was a graduate student at the Oxford Internet Institute. And as I said, I'm talking about the intersection between um, government open data and people, and specifically personal data. Um, we're, gonna, we're going to wrestle with the question of, in data, what makes a person? So it may seem obvious that my personal banking records, for example, are my personal data, but what about a study done by the census on the banking behaviors of Americans, assuming that I was a study participant? Okay, so that's sort of obviously impersonal, um, but, uh, but where's the line that divides the two? Okay. We're gonna walk through how the US and the UK have de facto answered the question of defining people and data by their differing approaches to protecting privacy while releasing open data. Specifically, we're gonna consider how can we derive a theory of personhood from their actions. First, let's step back and define what I mean by government open data. Okay, open data is structured information made free and public with open license for reuse. The word structured here being key, as government open data is not just about government transparency, but about a particular sort of structured and machine readable information being made available to the public. The movement for government open data is fairly new, dating back less than 10 years, but its popularity has spread widely. The image here, by the way, is from the World Wide Fa Web Foundation's Open Data Barometer Report from 2015, with the countries colored in being those with some sort of open data. The darker the color, the higher their capacity. Okay, so we talked about a little about the momentum behind the, behind the government open data movement, but where does this data come from and why is that important? Okay, so the, so Despite the sort of widespread enthusiasm among a lot of people in government for open data, the data that's released is generally reactive and not proactive. And by that I mean that no government has released all structured information under their auspices. There's a lot of different reasons about why governments might release um, some information, not others, but privacy is a consistent consideration. The image here, by the way, is from um, the federal open data portal, data.gov. Um, and you can get some sense of the types of data contained within, as well as just the sheer number of data sets there. So I mentioned that I'm talking about government open data and its intersection with privacy. Um, what do I mean exactly by personal data that's contained within government open data portals? So um, this kind of personal data can come from lots of different forms that you might fill out and submit to the government that are filled out for one reason, but are then the data is released by another. So this image, for example, is from the Federal Election Commission's um, donation records search. So as is the impulse with any <laughs> search portal, I narcissistically search 
for my own name. <laughs> I've never donated to a federal campaign, so instead I got the records of Steve Ahern. Uh, it's election donation data is released in order to curb corruption, but once, once it's out there, it can be put to a lot of different marketing purposes or other commercial use. And you can really see here why. From um, just these records, we can get a sense of the different cities in Washington that Steve Ahern has lived in in the last few years, as well as the name of his employer. Um, so this type, of, this type of personal data is not released in every, t in every type of open data portal. Um, it really varies depending on regulation in the country. So for example, um, in broad strokes, the UK has much greater data protection than the United States. Um, thanks to the Data Protection Act of 1998, you couldn't release somebody's, an individual person's name in an open data portal the way that we saw with Steve Ahern and these, those FEC donation records. Um, in the US, federal protection of, uh, federal data protection is really limited to HIPAA, some, um, some restrictions on releasing social security numbers, and the Data Privacy Act of 1974 which not only is it <laughs> 30 years out of date, 40, but it is only covers data held by the federal government, not anything held by state or local governments or anything held by private organizations. And I think um, this, this, I chose this image because it's, a, it's an indication of the, this cookie privacy policy notification. The cookie policy notification here is an indication of the differences in regulation between the two countries. If you visit the BBC US website, you wouldn't see such a no no notification. They're not required since you don't have the same right to know information that's being collected about you. Um, so let's get to my study that I was saying that I was going to talk about. Okay, so I interviewed um, munis municipal open data administrators in 12 cities in the US and the UK. Um, I asked them about how they dealt with privacy in a day-to-day -day way, as well as um, reviewed the legislation, how, how laws in those areas defined people. Um, the, I chose the placement of, these, of this study as both the US and the UK have really strong open data programs. In that open data barometer report I talked about at the beginning, the UK is ranked number one, the US is ranked number two, but they have very different regulatory frameworks regarding personal data. Um, so what did I find? Um, the UK open data administrators followed all of the guidelines that they received in order to anonymize data and they received really specific guidelines. So for example, not only can you not release somebody's name, but you can't have any cell that pertains to fewer than six people, like the number of 90 year olds in a given geographic area. If there happened to be four 90 year olds, you would have to um, replace the true number of four with a zero before releasing that, that data set. Um, in contrast, the administrators of open data programs in the US live in kind of interesting gray zone where they receive really few restrictions on the type of data that they can release, but they're also not just releasing anything that's within their grasp. They're actively crafting their own guidelines and their own definitions of what counts as personal in data and what's too personal to be released. Looking at some of these examples, we can ascertain that data, that personhood in data is defined by these um, in administrators in US open data programs is defined by context and consequences. So in this quote here from Tom Shank Jr., who's the chief data officer of Chicago, he's describing why the city decided to not release uh, detailed taxi ride data because of the sort of imagined nightmare scenario where people could identify others' home addresses from this data. Uh, the Uncomfortable is an interesting word that he uses here. Shank says it does cross a, cross a threshold where we are uncomfortable with releasing this. Uncomfortable really casting this as a personal decision. Um, it's also worth noting that this is definitely reactive to uh, Chris Wong's FOIA of the Taxi and Limousine Commission data in New York and um, some of the backlash to the potential uses of that data that were uh, came out after it was released. Um, in, this, in this quote, Matthew Esquivel, who's in charge of the open data program in Austin, is describing why that city decided to not release address level crime data, even though the Austin City Police Department specifically requested for that to be released. And he's saying 
um, it's partly because of the missing context then that would be present in the data. He says, because you might have some sensitive crimes that may be reported to a specific address and there's never an outcome. You never know, was that real? What was the story behind it? And here, what's too personal is the fact that this crime data is without context rather than the fact that the crime took place. Um, and one, one last thing on this that I want to say is that if the definition of government open data is, is that which is structured and machine readable, then the definition of government open data itself is expanding as more data becomes, more formats become readable by machines and specifically formats such as video. So a lot of the participants in the US that I spoke with mentioned um, police body camera data, uh, police body camera footage in their thoughts on privacy and government open data. No city has released and all, all police body camera footage, but in certain states, depending on state law, it's available by FOIA. So this is true in Washington state, for example, where the Seattle Police Department has experimented with putting um, blurred, heavily blurred and soundless versions of the video on YouTube. Thank you, Tim. Okay, so uh, why, uh, what can these definitions of, of privacy, um, how do these definitions of privacy translate to government open data programs? The study finds that, that personhood in data in the U.S. is defined in economic terms and really takes an individualistic view of personal data. Personhood in the, U in, in the U.S. emerges only when the data concerns the, pers the physical body, like health data, or a bureaucratic identifier, like your social security number. And that's partly because of the potential economic consequences that can come from having your, your social security number um, made public. Um, the U.S. publishes far more personal data and it's open amidst its open data portals than the U.K. does, but counterintuitively, the administrators of the programs in the U.S. have far more internalized these ethical concerns and several instances pushing back and withholding data because from, from open data portals because they think it's far too personal. Um, so, so to end with, I want to say why, why does all of this matter? Um, so the study finds that while government open data programs continue to evolve, it's likely that the conception of people in data will evolve along with the data itself. Indeed, the more data it's released, the easier it is for the data to become de-anonymized or connected to a, tied to a specific person. Comparing US and UK perspectives provide an important indication not only of differing views and what makes a human human in data, but also how these views might continue to, to, continue to evolve as open data programs continue to develop. Thank you. So, hello, my name is Jack Webster from the University of Southampton. I'm going to be talking about um, algorithmic taste makers. So, in the age of digital music consumption, we are faced with an overwhelming amount of content and choice, combined with a growing number of online avenues through which we can access it. Record labels have licensed up to 40 million tracks to digital music providers, and with the rise of subscription to ad supported music streaming services, such as Deezer, Spotify, and Apple, you have legal access to this licensed music at relatively low cost. The amount of overwhelming amount of digital content makes the act of exploring and discovering new music beyond our known favorites challenging. In response to this, many digital music providers provide automated recommendation services which attempt to help us discover new music. And these systems exploit the growing volume, velocity, and variety of digital data accumulated about who we are and how we listen to music online. So how many of you listen to music using a digital music service such as a music streaming service. Okay, uh, nearly majority of us. How many of you have ever used the curation and recommendation services they provide? That's the biggest response I've got so far, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how many of you could explain to the room how these recommender systems actually work? 
Okay, there's there's fewer. [laughs] Yeah, there's fewer of them. [laughs] So yeah, just from your responses here today, we can see how the consumption of digital music is growing and the use of these recommendation service is is following suit. But we as everyday consumers tend to know li- very little about what's going on and what these a- algorithms actually do. But by exploiting data about who we are and how we listen to music online, these computational systems aim to exercise influence over the culture that we consume. So as famously discussed by Eli Pariser in his book, The Filter Bubble, they may have come to shape our consumption behaviors and broader cultural tastes, and this is of interest to me in my research. However, the attempt to influence taste and the consumption of culture is nothing new. Back in the 1960s, the concept of the cultural intermediaries was proposed by Pierre Bourdieu to describe the actors involved in the shaping of taste. Initially intended to consider the activities of cultural critics, radio programmers, and advertising professionals, Bourdieu described how these actors drew on their feel for the game, underpinned by deep cultural knowledge and expertise, to support this consumption of specific cultural goods, such as food, music, and fashion. Scholars, such as Morris 2015, are beginning to recognize some of the similarities between music recommender systems and the taste-making work of cultural intermediaries. Furthermore, scholars have speculated upon how music recommender systems have the potential to shape the formation of individual cultural tastes in new ways. As Beer 2013 suggests, quote, cultural know-how might be decoupled from the types of socialization processes that are more dependent on the friendship group and the consumption of the right type of broadcast media outputs, end quote. However, before addressing these types of issues raised by Beer and others, I would like to make a theoretical intervention and critically consider the relevance of the concepts of cultural intermediaries and Bourdieu's theoretical framework for unpacking the social consequences of music recommender systems and similar computational agents on the web. And the reason for this is because we are no longer dealing with just human actors, like Bourdieu's cultural intermediaries of the 1960s, but computational systems made up of a mixture of human and technological components, such as data, algorithms, users, and engineers. Therefore, the aim of this presentation is to explore briefly the, the strengths and weaknesses in Borgia's approach and consider how we can rework the concepts of cultural intermediaries in order to more adequately take into account the difference between music recommender systems and the actors first conceptualized by Borgia. So in other words, we're going on a theoretical roller coaster in 10 minutes, so do strap in. <laughs> so <laughs> according to Borgia, cultural intermediaries are the professional tastemakers and vendors of symbolic goods, such as advertising and marketing material, magazine reviews and editorials, and lifestyle advice and pedagogy. They frame cultural goods symbolic value and forge a sense of identification between the cultural product and its potential consumer. For example, music critics review new music and frame certain artists or bands as worthy of listening to. The concept of cultural intermediaries emerges out of Borgia's broader theoretical framework, which is defined by the concepts of capital, habitus, and field. Cultural intermediaries are contextualized actors operating within a field of relations. We can think of this as a social arena or marketplace. Cultural intermediaries' authority in the field is based upon their accumulation of cultural capital, combined with their position in the marketplace. And cultural capital refers to value, cultural expertise, knowledge, and familiarity. Meanwhile, cultural intermediaries' positioning and actions within the field are regulated by habitus. This concept refers to negotiation between individual agency and the historical norms and values of the field. And habitus forms the basis of an intermediary's perception and appreciation of culture, their feel for the game in determining and shaping the value of cultural goods. So the strengths of Borgia's theoretical framework for the purposes of studying music recommender systems are that it provides us with a means for explaining how their cultural authority over the shaping of taste is constructed through the concept of cultural capital. And we might want to go on to examine what forms of cultural capital music recommender systems are in possession of and how is it, it is accumulated and valued in relation to the field. Meanwhile, Borgia's concept of habitus can help us consider whether structural norms of the field shape the algorithmic decision-making of music recommender systems. We might want to consider the recommendation systems how, how recommendation systems negotiate social dimensions, such as class, gender, and age, which are traditionally understood to affect taste and the consumption of culture. Using Borgia in this way allows us to conceptualize music recommender systems in a structured field of relations rather than positioning as external objective mediators of culture. However, a crucial limitation of Borgia is that it privileges human agency over technological and its proposition that technology is an objectification of cultural capital is particularly problematic. 
Whilst this helps Bourdieu explain how cultural consumption is one of the drivers of social distinction, it is problematic because it demotes technology to symbolic projections of capital and fails to engage with the specific socio-materiality of technologies themselves. In particular, this conceptualization suggests that technology doesn't have agency to affect outcomes. However, some scholars such as H. Rich 1992 argue against this and suggest technologies can have agency because they enable and constrain action. For example, the act of a person designing a piece of software is affected by the constraints of programming languages and logic, as well as the memory and processing capabilities of their computer. Therefore, if we're embracing this viewpoint, we need to be more attentive to the contributions of both human and technological actors when we are analyzing user economic systems as cultural intermediaries. In order to do this, I suggest we need to think socio-technically, meaning we need to sh think about how the cultural intermediation performed by recommender systems is shaped by both human and technological actors. And we can combine Borgia with a theoretical perspective um, inspired by the tradition of actor network theory in order to achieve this. There is much more to be said on how we might combine these theoretical perspectives and how we negotiate some of the theoretical differences between a and and Bourdieu, um, which is something I've written about elsewhere and don't necessarily have the time to do today. But the core message for today is thinking about the value of thinking socio-technically. So actor network theory proposes that technology is the effect or the outcomes of networks of human and non-human actors, which together make technology form and function. As well as bringing non-human actors into the frame of reference, a and is supersymmetric, meaning no actor, human or non-human, is privileged a priori over others. And this allows a and to con consider technologies as accidents rather than artifacts a la Bourdieu. Therefore, a music recommender system can be thought of as an actor network, which is made up of users, designers, engineers, databases, algorithms, and other human and non-human actors. And the music recommender system only exists as such because these things are working together. By drawing upon a and insistence upon the relative importance of both human and technological actors and combining this with Borgia's theoretical framework, I argue that we can successfully evolve both human and technological actors in the study of music recommend systems as cultural intermediaries. For example, we might examine what cultural capital, in other words, what forms of knowledge and expertise are valued by music consumers and others, and consider what cultural capital they are in possession of and how they accumulate it. So if we recall cultural capital is a cultural intermediaries, cultural authority over the shaping of taste. And therefore, if I understand the basis of music recommender systems, cultural capital, we can consider their authority within the field and why we delegate that authority and legitimacy to them. So perhaps the music recommender systems, cultural capital, is an outcome of its ability to aggregate lots of information about different styles of music and identify music that is similar to things you have li listened to in the past. Or is it its ability to represent a model individual's cultural taste and identify other users who are similar to us? Further research is needed to understand what forms of expertise music recommender systems are in possession of and how we might achieve this. But this is research that I'm currently engaged in. But the argument me being made here today is that we should approach research from a socio-technical perspective, analyze how human and technological actors, actor networks in A&T terms, co-construct music recommender systems cultural authority over the shaping of taste. In other words, we would analyze how the accumulation of cultural capital is the outcome of the combined activities of users, engineers, data, algorithms, which make up a recommender system. So similarly, we might consider how the structural norms internalized through Habitus pervade music recommender systems and influence the recommendations it makes. Because Habitus influences the decisions of the designers and engineers in music recommender systems, we need to consider whether their decisions inscribe historical norms or values such as the norms around how age, gender, and class should be modeled in relation to taste into the recommendation technology and how the technology shapes and constrains these norms and how they are actually inscribed into the technology in the first place. Further research is also needed to understand how structural norms and social dimensions shape the culture and mediation performed by recommended systems. But again, the argument being made here today is that we need to approach this from a socio-technical perspective and analyze how both humans and technologies together produce these social effects and drawing upon a and inspired approach helps us to achieve this. So, these provocations for future research highlight how we might conceptualize music recommend systems as cultural intermediaries from a socio-technical perspective, and how we might draw upon the strengths of Bourdieu 
in the form of his concepts of capital, habitus, and field, while supplementing Borgia's disregard for technological agency with an ANT inspired approach. There is much research still to be done, which I and others are in the process of producing, but hope you now recognize the relevance and value of thinking socio technically when examining the social significance of music recommended systems and similar computational agents, especially when thinking about these systems as cultural intermediaries and in relation to taste making processes. So, in conclusion, by thinking socio technically, we can continue to use the concepts of cultural intermediary as a lens through which to examine the changing dynamics of cultural consumption encountered in the digital age and how computational agents on the web, such as music recommended systems, are increasingly becoming implicated in this. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. All right, so this is a different talk than the one that I said I was going to give, but it's still like, <laughs> it, it's, oh shit. Don't worry, it's still like really doctrinaire anthropology, so you're gonna get, it's not about totem, it's about gift economies now, and it's gonna be fine. Okay, uh, so this talk uh, starts from two terminological puzzles. Uh, the first of these puzzles is the popularity starting about two decades ago of describing the circulation of information on the internet as a kind of gift economy, in spite of the fact that traditional gift economies, as studied by anthropologists, I promised I was going to be Dr. Nair, uh, bore little resemblance to this kind of free utopian exchange that had picked up the name. So the second puzzle uh, is the etymology of the word data, which has come to be a matter of public interest, derived from data science, big data, blah, blah, blah. Um, so data, as you might know, derives from the Latin which means to give, but uh, so data are what is given, right? Uh, but if you're someone whose data is being mined, it doesn't feel like you gave it, it feels like someone took it. Okay, so in the rest of this talk, I'm gonna try to use these two puzzles to solve each other. First, we have to go back to the late 1990s. Except that there is that guy. Um, here's Eric Raymond, uh, open source software advocate in his essay, Homesteading the Noosphere, in which he writes that hacker culture is a gift culture in which participants compete for prestige by giving time, energy, and creativity away. And I left my water over here. Okay, so hackers, according to Raymond, uh, they don't work in an exchange culture where you, you know, you're familiar with this, you do work and you get paid. Uh, they instead exchange the, pro the, the sort of products of their labor uh, for prestige. And he picked this idea up indirectly sort of from anthropology, which had for some time studied these things that we called gift economies, which were structures of exchange that seemed very puzzling to Europeans, in which it seemed like people would just sometimes give stuff away without asking for any payment. Raymond, as I'm sure you know, was not the only guy drawing analogies to gift economies, and open source software was not the only object of comparison. So we heard about gift economies in all sorts of domains, from file sharing to blog posting. Here is hypermedia researcher, uh, uh, what's his name? Richard Barbrook, uh, in his 1998 essay called The High Tech Gift Economy. He says, when they go online, almost everyone spends most of their time participating within the gift economy rather than engaging in market competition. For most people, the gift economy is simply the best method of collaborating together in cyberspace. Within the mixed economy of the net, capital N, uh, anarcho-communism has become an everyday reality. Anarcho, okay, uh, so Barbrook traces this idea back to the French situationists who, drawing on that same work by anthropologists, use the notion of a gift economy to imagine an alternative to capitalism, a utopian vision of free exchange that's rooted in abundance, uh, where people just give stuff away. So as Barbrook put it, uh, according to the situationists, the tribal gift economy demonstrated that individuals could successfully live together without needing either the state or the market. Terrific, okay. Um, so this understanding of gift economies is kind of unsatisfying. Uh, it was, to put not too fine a point on it, a, view, a vision of the noble savage, an entity defined by absence, right? We don't know exactly what he does, but we know it's not capitalism, and we like that. 
uh, it participated in this sort of constellation of troubling analogies between an emerging net culture and an idealized primitive society, right? So not only do we have gift economies, we have tribes. Not only do we have tribes, but this idea that maybe we're returning to a, a primitive oral culture. Um, so by now, in 2016, it's probably been a while since you've heard someone describe the internet as a gift economy, hopefully, except for this jokey panel title here called GIF Economies. Um, for one. For one thing, it seems rather dated, like talking about cyberspace or surfing the web. Uh, for another, it seems even more poorly suited to the internet today, where commercial platforms have displaced many of these networks that people thought of as feeling gift-like. So now, instead of, instead of sharing files through Napster, you probably listen to music licensed via a streaming service like Spotify through one of these you know, music recommendation uh, layers. Uh, so, but gifts have not left contemporary visions of the internet. They've just gotten bigger. I am talking, of course, about big data, the large-scale aggregation and analysis of materials like user activity logs, because maybe you didn't know what big data was. Um, big data is often described as an enormous gift to corporations. It's a valuable resource for action that is effectively just landed in their laps, opening up new possibilities for revenue and decision-making, in case you don't believe me. Uh, here is Google's Eric Schmidt, very charismatic guy, uh, and he writes, for governments and companies, this thriving data set is a gift, enabling them to better respond to citizen and customer concerns, to precisely target specific demographics of the population, and with the emergent field of predictive analytics, to predict what the future will hold. Um, but big data is a big gift in another sense as well, as I mentioned a minute ago. Uh, the word data derives from the Latin word dare, to give, thus data are what is given, uh, the empirical stuff from which humans can construct their facts and build their theories and produce their knowledge. Uh, so as far as corporations are concerned, data is a gift in two senses. Uh, it's a nice, valuable surprise, and it's what is given. Both of these positions, uh, as you likely know, have been subjected to extensive critique. If you're here, you've probably read some of this stuff. On the one hand are the arguments that big data is not a gift, uh, it's the product of user activity that, because it produces value, uh, can be thought of as labor. Uh, the fruits of this labor are not given to corporations, but taken from users. Thus, uh, critics like Johanna Drucker have suggested that we might more appropriately call this CAPTA, to etymologically emphasize that it is not given, but taken, right? If data are given, then CAPTA are captured. Um, on the other hand, there are arguments that we should not think of data as simply given in the sense of objective. Data are constructed and chosen, and thus they bear biases. So I can just point to work like Lisa Gittleman's edited volume, Raw Data is an Oxymoron, or to Dana Boyd and Kate Crawford's journal article, Critical Questions for Big Data. Hopefully you know the deal, because I only got 12 minutes. Um, okay, so two gift-related puzzles. First, a gift economy that is actually a utopian fantasy of free exchange and kind of problematic for a variety of reasons. And second, big data, which is a big gift that doesn't feel like a gift at all, at least not to people who aren't corporations or governments. So I think that we can find a solution to uh, both of these puzzles, one that ties them together by going back to the anthropological root of talk about gift exchange. Um, Marcel Mauss's The Gift, which was originally published in French in 1925. So the book is a high-level comparison of ethnographic data from Melanesia, Polynesia, and the Pacific Northwest, which aims to get at some standard cross-cultural features of gift economies. Um, why, to the colonial European eye, do people around the world sometimes seem to just give stuff away? Um, so like the more recent invocations of gift economies, most describes the gift in contrast to stereotypical commodity exchange like that, um, a commodity exchange happens in a moment, with two parties swapping goods at once and then going on their way. Gift exchanges are different. Um, they are centrally defined by a lag, by a delay in the exchange. I give you something now, Chris, uh, and you are obligated to give me something back in the future, but not yet. The central feature of a gift in this sense is not altruism or selflessness or charity, the kind of Christmassy fantasies that for Euro-Americans defines a gift. The central feature of a gift exchange is lag. So lag is where gifts get their power. Uh, during the lag, you and I are tied together by the anticipation of your return. Gifts are a promise that you will repay me, but also that our relationship will persist into the future. And my gift to you is suffused with what the Maori call how, and we might call the spirit of the gift the memory that the gift is from me in particular, that it represents your obligation back to me, uh, and that in the future you will give me a gift in return, and the relationship of obligation will continue. Um, but like other promises, gifts are lively with the possibility that things will fall apart, that our attempts to persist socially through time will fail. Very sad. Um, okay, in this understanding, right, then gifts are centrally matters of obligation, not charity, and obligation lives in the lag. So returning to the, those turn-of-the-century gift economy fantasies, we can see what's missing. 
obligation. When people like Eric Raymond invoked the idea that hacker culture is like a gift culture, they focused on the giver, the person whose fame would spread with the products of their work. We might instead focus on the receiving end of the exchange, the person who instead of accruing prestige, accrues obligations. This person is a necessary party to gift exchange, and in these fantasies of gift economies, they basically don't exist. Instead, the gift economy looked a lot more like a big old gift to us. A big unspecified we is the recipient of good circumstances, and if we're thinking of gifts in the Euro-American sense, we're thinking that this is something like eternal Hanukkah, a lamp that stays lit forever and gives us new presents every day. Um, so now, if we were socialized into a gift economy in Moses' sense, this would be terrifying. Uh, to receive more and more gifts is to receive more and more obligations to repay, to be cast into debt and submission. So gifts are agonistic, and in many gift economies, massive gifts are used to establish hierarchy among groups. So, uh, the ethnographic film, Anka's Big Mocha, which you may have seen in an undergraduate anthropology course, uh, depicts a New Guinea big man collecting together the stuff to make an enormous gift, or mocha, to one of his rivals. By the end, Anka has amassed 600 pigs, 10,000 Australian dollars, 12 cassowaries, eight cows, a motorcycle, and a pickup truck uh, to be given away to one of his enemies. Uh, Anka says at the Mocha, and I quote, now that I have given you these things, I have won. I have knocked you down by giving you so much. Uh, the recipients of the gift who are unable to pay it back and actually obligated to not pay it back right away are locked into a relationship of obligation, whether they want to be or not. Now, if the gift economy felt like a big gift to us, big data feels like a big gift to them, a vague other that might mean something like governments and corporations. Um, but there is a sense, as Melissa Gregg has described it, that this data is a, quote, a gift that is not given. Or we might say it's one given out of obligation. As most writes in the gift, uh, in a gift economy, one gives because one is compelled to do so, not out of the kindness of your Christmas time heart. Um, so, in conclusion, one vision of the history of the internet economy is that a protean gift culture was taken over by capitalism. That once upon a time we were free exchangers, living in a kind of pre-capitalist, anarcho-communist, cyber-primitive society. But now the capitalists have done it again, displacing gifts with commerce and the pleasures of giving with the pain of payment. This vision, as I've indicated here, uh, is bullshit, both in how it fantasizes about actually existing gift economies and in how it imagines the internet as an untainted and thus nobly savage space. Um, a more anthropological understanding of the gift provides a different interpretation of what has happened. The gift economy was the originary gift, and now, after some lag, with big data, comes our obligation to repay. Data is actually a gift, but it's one that we give out of obligation. Thus, a couple decades late, uh, some features of, tr of traditional gift economies at last do help us understand things about information flows online. The obligation to give one's data in exchange for the use of free services, the sense that this gift is not really a gift at all, but a right to take an obligation, and a feedback loop in which successively larger gifts of data for services threaten to destabilize social and economic order. This is a thing that actually happens. Um, like other gift economies, this one is not composed of a utopian free circulation of goods, data, content, whatever, um, but rather of intensifying mutual obligation, gifts that do not feel like they are given, and relationships from which it is increasingly impossible to escape. Thanks. Hi, my name is Maria. And this is me. <laughs> this is me too. And this is also me. <laughs> Seems like I have a multiple personality. Well, not really. I guess most of you might have noticed the phenomenon that depending on where you sh share your photos, they might look very differently. Anyone wants to guess which app or platform these photos belong to? The first one. LinkedIn? <laughs> Any other guesses? <laughs> Facebook? No, it's WhatsApp. The second one? Instagram. Yes. The third one? Yes. So, that's <laughs> so how do you know where these photos uh, have been posted? Of course, we're used to specific aesthetics that appear to be specific to these platforms. And this aesthetic is also entangled with algorithm and code, with the hardware and the software that 
I'm not trying. I'm just not gonna grab it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, but we adopt, so, yeah. So it's sp specific to the apps, of course. Um, and the visual conventions and iconographies, uh, they're really made explicit. And we adopt and we reproduce them on a ma mainly implicit level. So showing and sharing photos has, of course, always been mediated and always entangled with hardware and software, also in analog photography. But with the rise of social media, we as researchers became more aware of this mediation and of the entanglement with al algorithm and code of these visuals. So in my research, I'm interested in how specific photo sharing practices are happening on smartphones and especially how repertoires of apps are used to share photos. And I'm not studying this on a large scale, but on a micro level, so I'm interested in personal, individual sharing politics. A useful framework for me to think through the concepts and theories that are relevant theoretically and empirically is this one, Image, Medium, Body, the triad by art historian Hans Belting. Uh, starting with image, I'm studying digital pictures, mainly photos, uh, and of course, uh, Iconographies and visual conventions, as we know from art history and visual studies, can be quite persistent. Um, so how we depict our bodies, how we frame, how, how from which perspective we show us or stuff that we want to show to someone. The smartphone, uh, the device itself, is also a networked camera. It has continuous global connectivity. And it, of course, the software, as I said, is a specific part I'm interested in. And I'm interested in how the architecture of the interface of the software might structure communicative and social processes. So how they afford possibilities and constraints for sharing pictures. pictures. The body, of course, how media technologies are used um, in our everyday lives is very strongly influenced by our embodied and um, by our embodied experience and knowledge by routines and by habitus. And how um, we show and share ourselves in offline too has extensively been studied. And it's of course crucial in terms of sociality and for example, by Irving Goffman. And also I heard the term prismatic identity just in the panel before, A1, maybe someone else was there. I find it really um, inspiring. So as I said, this has been studied um, a lot for offline socialities, but when we talk about um, the publics we deal with now, they are networked and the temporal and spatial structure is quite different. So in my research, for example, I found that binary categories like public and private are not helpful anymore. So it became more complex and I will talk about that in a minute. So these are the three components that become relevant and that I'm interested in in their entangled logics and also their hybrid agency. So let me just briefly show you how I tackled this empirically. As a social scientist and qualitative researcher, even when I try to understand hybrid agency and media practices, my first entry point are still the humans. So I conduct interviews with my participants. Um, they provide pictures. I follow them on social media if they allow me to do so. So I have a lot of different kinds of data. And in my analysis, I have, again, three parts the platforms, the accounts on the about the, the practices on the platforms, and visual expressions of practices. I try to relate those three parts and then compare the platforms, how the platforms are used to each other. So let me now show you some concrete empirical examples. Uh, the following examples are provided by a group of teenage girls that I interviewed in 2013 and 14. And they use a broad variety of platforms and how to use uh, three of them I want to introduce to you today. We start off with Instagram. Um, since this interview, Instagram has of course changed, uh, but the basic setup remains the same. So the picture is the start of the communication and it can be framed by location data, hashtags, et cetera, followed by comments. This was one of Anna's first pictures on Instagram and she has already deleted it by now. <laughs> the girls told me that to them, Instagram is used as display for the most beautiful picture, but also to show their editing skills. And on your Instagram account, pictures are exhibited chronologically, 
which allows for showing change and continuity throughout time. And of course, it's also possible to curate this exhibition. The girls' pictures become part of a continuous flow of photos of their friends, but also from brands and celebrities. And Instagram to them is a space where they negotiate friendships, friendship hierarchies, but also their editing skills, their aesthetic skills within the peer group. Most of the comments that they get are from friends and they're constantly commenting each other and a colleague of mine called that affirmation syndicate. I think that's very important. So the next stage is WhatsApp. That's one of the most popular messaging apps right now in Austria. When you open WhatsApp, the first step is that you choose who you want to communicate with, which personal group you want to communicate with. And this is also the most important affordance of WhatsApp to differentiate very detailed and very explicitly what is communicated to and with whom. So that's what they told me about their groups. And then another group with us and Tom, Bela's brother and Leah. Yes, and Leah and Ina. And then another one without Ina. <laughs> and then another one for French and one just the three of us and one for homework and another one with Sarah, Lara and me and an idiot group, and then the one where we all are. <coughs> so as you see, it's quite complicated. <laughs> uh, sharing images is just one option among others. Um, what is very common with the girls is sharing screenshots, or so pictures like the one you see here, fries before guys, yes. <laughs> and uh, also with school stuff, visual notes, products while they're shopping, etc. Constant connectivity is something that is crucial in WhatsApp, and the app allows you to see if someone is online, if the person agreed that you can see it, when he or she was last online, if he saw the message, etc. Our last stage is Snapchat, and of course this has been studied extensively by Nathan and others, and Snapchat has also changed a lot and evolved since the interview. They recently added video effects, which I really love. So once you open Snapchat, your screen immediately turns into your front camera display, suggesting you to take a picture of your face right now. The picture you share is only visible for a few seconds to the person you share it with, and then disappears again. This nowness has been framed as one of the most important affordances, or maybe the most appealing affordance of Snapchat. Pictures can be enhanced with emojis, drawing, comic style eyes like we just saw, and the girls provided pictures with a raw, twisted aesthetic, sometimes even psychedelic. To them, Snapchat is where you post ugly pictures. <laughs> well, for example, you're sitting on a toilet and then you take a picture of your feet and write, I'm on a toilet right now. <laughs> <laughs> Those pictures are only shared with a very trustworthy, intimate audience. To Bela, I could send everything, any kind of stupid stuff, and it wouldn't matter. So to summarize, <laughs> how are these apps used by this group of girls? The pictures posted to and on Instagram are the ones that the girls frame as classically beautiful. Polished, they spend quite some time on polishing these pictures. And the Instagram audience is quite diffuse and clear. And it is a space where they negotiate friendships and editing skills. WhatsApp is for the bad pictures in a sense that they don't have to be aesthetically pleasing. It's more important that certain information is conveyed or shared with a specific, clearly defined audience. Ugly pictures are posted on Snapchat, and ugly really is the term they use themselves, but also in a sense of intimate and authentic, and nowness, as I said. On a more theoretical note, um, what we clearly see, also with my pictures, <laughs> that um, users exploit the possibility to create partial identities. And there is an extreme fragmentation of private public spheres that we can trace empirically. Also, the users manage their relationship through deciding who they want to communicate with where. So this is very important. And there have been, uh, been two studies by Mika Mariano, who also thought about this in terms of uh, migrant uh, workers who communicate with the children, and one about uh, from Ilona Gershon, who thought about this regarding breaking up in times of Facebook. So how we manage our relationships is strongly entangled with the media logics that these apps offer. 
if we uh, continue to research this, and I think it's really important to agree with the think more about the socio-technical logic of our everyday socialities. Um, we have to think about also about temporalities, about t database structure, interaction structure, in regard to how they become important for our visibility politics. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. That was a really, really great presentation. Um, just for anyone watching on the live stream, if you have a question, feel free to tweet uh, C2. And I'll be pulling from my phone. But do we have any questions from the audience at all? Who wants to start? <laughs> you? Uh, I can say this one. Go ahead. Um, that's a, I mean, there's that's a complicated question, which there's, as you, I'm sure you know, a lot of different different answers to. I would actually say, I mean, I was we were all kind of talking about, you know, in different ways, the anxieties that that we're all facing from having decisions about our decisions about our data being out of our own control. But I think that there could have been an, you know, another presentation on um, you know, all of these, these interesting, potentially beneficial things that are coming from uh, aggregated, be access to aggregated information. And so um, I think that while there should be stronger, an uh, allowance for stronger controls over, for individuals over their own data, I would argue against, um, against complete control. <laughs> well, and sort of a, a another way of thinking about that is that what I've been trying to do is think of sort of alternative ways to imagine these kinds of exchange. Right? So to say, should people have control over their data is to say, okay, well, your data is kind of your property. And I kind of endorse this idea by saying, okay, maybe we gave it to corporations. But you don't have to believe the way that I just said it here, right? Maybe your data, like I think companies, maybe like the like music recommendation companies, for example, um, wouldn't necessarily think of your listening data as yours in some sense, right? It's in part theirs as well, or it's, some, it's something else. And so we can think of other models of what relationship do people have to data other than ownership. And those don't have to be like utopian, like nobody has property models. Those can be like kinship models. These are related to us in some sense. Those can be uh, nat like models from nature, like these are resources that get returned to the earth in some, in some sense over time. There's a ton of different ways you could imagine this. Um, yeah, I agree with both these things. I think a one step forward maybe is to sort of promote an awareness of how your data is used by companies in the production of different s services and complementary tools that we use because they give us some value. And then if it's necessary, well, yeah, potentially, if it's necessary to then lobby and say, we want more control over this data because you're using it in a way that is problematic to me, then that can follow the greater awareness. But in other instances, that, that kind of, the consequences might be lower and the, the need to have greater control of your data might not be as important, but the awareness helps differentiate between those different scenarios and helps across the board. I think why are yeah. every city solving this? I actually have a question for all of y'all then. So this idea of like, you know, data ownership, um, but we've covered a lot of different tracks. Like we've covered um, hacking this idea of data exchange. We've covered algorithms inside of music and we've covered like privacy uh, inside the UK and the US. And so I wonder if as a user researcher who works on products that people touch, how do we like convey what that ownership is when data is used so prolifically and so widespread inside of culture? Like, what does data ownership look like to a person when they sometimes can't even see like the way the data is manifested, so to speak, or like what's happening inside these black box algorithms? And so, something you've touched on, Nick, I'm really curious about is how do we articulate like what is data in certain settings, right? Well, uh, sure. Uh, I think that there's there's a problem in that people usually call in these systems for transparency, and transparency is a really hard thing to achieve for a variety of reasons, from computational complexity to the kinds of things that c companies care about, you know, like their proprietariness and that and so on. Um, and so, 
there, I don't have good answers for for this kind of for this kind of question of like how to communicate what's going on. I think what we do need is more are more experimental answers of people trying different ways of doing this and trying to avoid some of these sort of already sedimenting ideas about what data is, how it interacts with algorithms, how it interacts with people, and so on. Just because I've heard a million and a half talks about like this algorithm needs to be transparent so we understand what's going on without any sense of what that would actually be like to have happen. So experiments in doing that, I think, are critical. So like research. Yeah. Well, one, one thing that I, I wanted to say in reaction to that is that um, what I was, was one of the things, the main things I was attempting to drive out with my talk is that there's a lot of differing perspectives on, on not on what data is yours, what data counts as personal data. And I think that that's something that part, it's having, having these differing, um, you know, this wide range of perspectives on it is problematic for the for this um, is a problematic foundation on which to build discussions of data data ownership. Because you know, if if you're if you're arguing for data ownership, then the first question has to be, well, what what data counts as mine? Is it is it anything that I touch? Is it anything that's about me? Does it have to have a lot of stuff about me? Do you have to be able to identify me from it? You know, there's all of these these questions that would would immediately come from that. Uh, and what I find in my research that because I also work with different age groups that uh, the younger people are quite aware of what happens to their data um, in general and um, they play with it also sometimes and, and the, the older generations they're mainly scared and confused um, but yeah I think it's important to, to look at how normal people <laughs> understand what data ownership actually means to them in their everyday lives. Um, I would I'd say that different s different stakeholders might have different views of what's a right amount of transparency. Um, in the case of music recommendation, there are efforts to kind of include explanations of, of how a recommendation was generated and has been tested around whether that produces, generates more trust and makes more influential and effective recommendations. But the recommender system and the music company is motivated by certain reasons to do that because they want to maintain engagement with their system whereas a government stakeholder might have different motivations for promoting transparency and building trust. And so I'll just, I'll just say differentiate on those lines as well. Um, yeah, Chris? Hi. Thank you, Jackie, for your answer. I found it interesting. Um, I had times when documents were things that I was impressed with because they're thoughtful or deserving of music taste. <laughs> disingenuous and creepy, but in the same way it's kind of familiar and nice, like your mother can make you a cup of tea in the back or <laughs> something <laughs> bizarre, you know, something you might need. So when you talk about, when you did your blog coverage for this talk, you did a different thing, you talked about motivation. What is your personal motivation to use your own data? <laughs> um, I love Spotify's music recommendations. This is why I was excited to hear your talk. I've had, um, I love them both in terms of um, the content that I get from them. Wow, this is sounding like an ad for Spotify. But I also, I, <laughs> but I'm also really, really interested in 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 using them in terms of how thinking about how how both how Spotify itself creates the recommendations and how more theoretically one can build recommendations like how you know is it is it based on my friends what my friends want to listen to is it based on what I want to listen to is it based on something I've never listened to or something that I would like and so this is what I was trying to say initially in terms of um, you know we've been sort of talking about I think potentially negative consequences of, of data use and there's a lot of positive ones <laughs> as well um, yeah 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 um, I think that your your examples are really interesting and with these recommendations I always find that at least anecdotally when they when they kind of get it right you don't necessarily notice that they're and they're working in your case it was kind of these are quite distinctive examples and then you notice notice them but then when you see recommendations they get it wrong and you think why on earth is that there then you can kind of become more aware that these things are perhaps technologies working and using our data and then you might then become more kind of self-conscious and self-aware that the data is there being used and you're giving it so i mean 
yeah, it's a difficult, it's a difficult question. And motivations, different people will have different motivations for using these services, including yeah, the the, just the music companies themselves and different users. Um, I think people, yeah, it depends how aware people are. I don't know how aware people are that they they are giving the data. And I, I think yeah, looking at where these these examples of where it gets it wrong or really kind of quite out there recommendations, how that affects how we identify with these with these services w and how we use them. Does that kind of produce greater trust with the system when it gets it so right or, or does it kind of neg negate it when it gets it so wrong? Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Oh, great, right here. Um, I'm not quite yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's really not about the roles, but uh, maybe functionality would be the more precise term. Um, and I wouldn't say that we have, that we show different roles. It's really maybe not the right term. Uh, so for WhatsApp, I it's really about connectivity and, and it's about sharing something really personal, um, which is not necessarily a different uh, person than you show yourself on Instagram, but it's a more more like when you go out and you dress up and you put on makeup, that's maybe Instagram. And when you hang out on your couch, eat popcorn, watch a movie, that's maybe Snapchat. So uh, I think we really have to think about it more in terms of um, phases in our lives, aspects of our identity, but not really roles, I think. And so I cannot give you a maximum number because uh, I really the panel, the first one was discussing this uh, in terms of uh, transgender persons and how they play with their identities and find um, like um, the right term to, to frame their gender or maybe it's not important to find the right term. So that would be a very specific case then, um, yeah. Yeah, um, just for people who don't know so great, the myth of or of primary barter is that like econ 101 bullshit story they tell you that's like, why does money exist? And it's like, well, we used to trade just like stuff with each other, but if <laughs> I didn't have the chickens that you wanted when you were going to give me the barrel, then how are we going to do anything? We needed to find something else to trade for. And that's fake. That's not a real story. That's never been a problem because people have been totally happy for a long time with doing exchanges on a delay. It's like not a big deal. Um, so what's interesting in the contemporary moment, I think, is kind of that. You enter into another... Um, into another mode of analysis almost where we can talk about debt and you know there was plenty of ways to talk about debt like Gray Wheeler does in his book um, and these attempts to put people into debt and that's sort of what these like you know big mocha type things are um, and I've seen so I do empirical work with people who do you know build algorithmic systems and they are very interested in getting more data to power the things that they feel like they need to build so that people will use their thing more and you see this spiral happening right you see more data being traded for more services and so on and everyone's a sort of doing it, and they feel like they have to do it. Um, and so I can't speak to like all of Graver's book because it's like this 
big. Um, that's <laughs> a cross section. Um, but yeah, that sort of points to a baby. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Right in the front row. Um, I had a question for Maria. Uh, it seems like your research, you didn't really talk so much about the framing, but it seems like you're focusing in on teenage girls. No? Okay, maybe. I, well, that's, that's what it seems yeah. like you were presenting, so I'm just wondering um, what was the impetus behind that decision, because there seems to be a particular kind of scrutiny we're seeing right now about specifically teenage girls and how they use um, social media. So I was just wondering what that, what your, Oh, I totally agree. And uh, that this is why I'm not only studying teenage girls. I just brought this example because this is really the group that ro uh, uses the broadest range of apps. So it's good to show how they use the specific apps. I'm studying also also boys and men and older people. For, um, so my my the larger frame of my study is really comparing uh, generations. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions from the audience? We have time for a few more. Dorothy? Well, Maria, you're, you're a bit of an outlier because you're actually looking also at, you know, photographic kind of platforms. So I'm wondering, specific to like algorithms, you know, the only one I could think of really that probably <coughs> would lend itself well to that is like Instagram with hashtags and being able to kind of create some kind of maybe quasi archive of like a specific idea or a specific trend. So I'm curious, like, Across the generations, was there a commonality, or what was what was the what was the commonality, and then what was the kind of difference that you saw? Well, about the commonality is really um, that um, sharing photos is something that uh, is crucial for sociality in any age group, of course, and and it's important how um, they to maintain relationships. What the, the difference uh, is that uh, the younger people use a broader variety of apps, which is also uh, interesting regarding uh, their age de developmental phase. So they're teenagers and, and they play with identity more than the older people. Um, so maybe it's more related to not their media competence and or them being uh, the net generation, but uh, them being teenagers and them wanting to show different parts of their identity, to manipulate photos, to to play with pictures. And for older people, it's really more about sharing um, pictures with an intimate circle of friends and family. They're not as interested in general. There are always exceptions, of course. Um, with uh, experimenting, playing with photos, and, and showing off on Instagram, for example. So that's uh, maybe the one of the differences. But I, I, I'm really quite convinced it's not about um, media competence and generation, but more about developmental stage. I actually, uh, does someone else have a question in the back? Yeah, okay, so the kind of <laughs> obligation that pred predictive policing fulfills, I don't know if I can figure that out. The, there is something about the, the, the sort of nonprofit side, though, right, where um, there's a book, uh, Jim Ferguson has a book called uh, Give a Man a Fish, which is about sort of these, like, so microcredit is maybe a better example of this, uh, where, you know, you give people little loans, and then that helps them do stuff. Um, what it also does is make them obligated to you. There's this sense in which, you know, sort of cross-culturally people f become obligated in response to, to <laughs> gifts, and so a lot of sort of uh, um, well-meaning uh, NGO projects that attempt to sort of help other people end up sort of making them subservient to them. Predictive policing is like a gory dystopian example of what an obligation might look like, right? Like we have an obligation to protect you, therefore we have an obligation to like use all this data. And I don't know if I can touch that because there's some shit going on there that, yeah. Um, so in terms of um, 
your wait, your question was the same for me or different? Um, yeah, I think both of you kind of talked about that. Okay, yeah, so I think predictive policing, I mean, I think I can agree that it's a dystopian uh, nightmare, but I, it, it's also interesting, I think, in con to think about in context of a lot of what we were talking about, which is, again, sort of problems of too much data or problems of uh, non-ownership or non-control of our own data. Um, and predictive policing is in some ways a flip of that because it's the, one of the central problems of predictive policing is that if you're, if you're policing based off of reported crimes and based off of um, areas in which crimes took place, you're going to disproportionately focus on those areas with the huge miss, missing data set of all the crimes that were not reported or all of the, the you know, um, all of the, the other things in which you would might want to, you might want police to cover but would not be, would not occur in, a, in a, a data set of crimes. And so I think, you know, the solution to predictive data, I don't mean, predictive policing, I don't mean to say is more data, but I mean it's, it's a problem in some ways of, of not having the right data set. But there's much greater problems with it than that. It kind of brings up this question as to like what is data, what is full data. So yeah. something to think about too is like Instagram is a lot of soft data about someone. Like you could draw these softer correlations, these emotional connotations of their lives with images that are not necessarily data. Images can lie. And so to pull on this idea of like predictive data, you know, how many like selfies at a bar does someone post? Does does that then determine later, like in a court of law, if they're a fit parent or not, or if there's a problem? And like we get into these ideas of like what is a problem and like where what is the greater story of this all right and like time time of like how people relate to apps that they're sharing on and like when they share things is also similar to i think missing the greater whole of like crime data right um i guess does anyone have any comments? i agree with question? you <laughs> <laughs> that's that's right um well, i guess we have like three minutes left um one more I was at, uh, <laughs> at an earlier panel, the A1 panel. Um, we, there were, one of the panelists was speaking about um, prismatic identities and um, using different names for different identities. And when you mentioned the partial identities that are sort of reported by uh, the, different, um, the different conventions and the different photos that you take on different platforms, I was wondering, did you notice if, um, if the users knew if the people you interviewed used the same screen name on different um, platforms, or did they use different ones? Um, if I remember correctly, they used different ones. Uh, most of them. But there are actually not a lot of people, and that's also the reason why I use the teenage group, that use such a broad variety of apps. And so that's maybe also important to say. Yeah, there are more people who use just WhatsApp, for example, in Austria at least. I don't know if it's really popular in the US too. Well, unless there's any more questions, this was a really, really great presentation and panel. Everyone, let's give a round of applause for our speakers. Yeah, I think that's yeah. 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 